Let's pray and ask God's blessing and then look at his word today. Oh, Father, Father in heaven, how grateful we are for Jesus Christ. Lord, would you help me to exalt him today in the ears of your people? Lord, I pray for every person listening. There may be some that are still in their sin, are still lost, still without a Savior. Lord, would you work in their hearts to give them new life, even as the word is preached? Would you open up their hearts to respond to the gospel today? And Lord, for those that know you, they're your sheep, would you just feed them? Lord, edify them, build them up. Make them strong in Jesus. Cause them to rejoice that they have a living Savior today. And we pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Would you agree with me that there's a lot of events that happen that really don't matter in the big scheme of things? For example, does it really matter who won the 1962 World Series? Nah. What about the 1977 Super Bowl? When to some people, that really matters. But in the big scheme of things, it's nothing. Uh, what about who won the 2005 National Banjo Championship? <laughs> who cares, right? In the, <laughs> in the big scheme of things, it doesn't matter. Um, what about how much money you're able to make in a year? Or over your entire life? Doesn't really matter. But there is one event in human history that matters tremendously that has eternal significance for every man, woman, boy, and girl that has ever lived, and that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I looked online yesterday and I found out that 64% of Americans still believe that Jesus rose from the dead bodily and physically. A majority. But is it important that Jesus actually did rise from the dead? Does that have any real significance? I think it does. In fact, I know it does. And we're going to look at three reasons why it matters that Jesus rose from the dead. Number one, it proved that Jesus was who he claimed to be. Now, for about six months before Jesus died, he would predict over and over that he was about to go to Jerusalem, he was about to die, and then he would rise on the third day. And I want to just read some of those texts to you today. These are all taken from the book of Matthew. The first one is in Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Now this took place about six months before the cross. Jesus is telling his disciples some very specific information. Number one, he's telling them what city he's going to die at. It's Jerusalem. Number two, he's telling them who's going to deliver him up. It's going to be the religious leaders of Israel. And number three, after he has died, he's going to be raised from the dead on the third day. But then in the very next chapter of Matthew, chapter 17, verse 9, Jesus has just been transfigured on the mountain, and Peter has been there. They've witnessed his face shining like the sun. He comes down from the mountain, and as they were coming down, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Again, he just kind of blurts it out. Uh, nonchalantly, just don't tell anybody about this until I have risen from the dead. Same chapter, Matthew 17, verse 22. And while they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were deeply grieved. You start to get the point that over and over again, he's telling them the same thing. I'm going to die. I'm going to be raised from the dead. But look at the final one here. It's in Matthew 20, verse 17. And as Jesus was about to go up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside by themselves, and on the way he said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will deliver him to the Gentiles, to mock and scourge and crucify him. And on the third day he will be raised up. 
Now we have a couple of additional details that he's giving. Notice how specific Jesus is. He doesn't just kind of in a general way say, I'm going to be dying soon. No, he says, we're going up to Jerusalem. I'm going to die there. I'm going to be delivered up by the religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, um, the chief priests. In fact, they're going to condemn me to death. And then I'm going to be delivered over to the Gentiles. Now, who would that be? It's the Romans. And the Romans are going to actually do the deed of crucifixion. These Gentiles are going to mock him. Here's just some additional details. They're going to mock him. They're going to scourge him. And then he tells them by what manner he's going to die. Up until this time, he's just said, I'm going to die. He says, they're going to crucify him. So I'm going to die by crucifixion. And then on the third day, the Son of Man is going to be raised up. Jesus predicted over and over and over that he was going to die, and then he was going to rise from the dead, and he did. Because we have an empty tomb three days later that cannot be explained any other way substantially. So Jesus did what he claimed he was going to do, didn't he? He predicted the hardest thing. He predicted this miracle. And the miracle came to pass. So what I want to cause you to think about is, I want you to pause and think about this. If Jesus was right when he said he was going to rise from the dead, shouldn't we also trust him when he speaks about other matters? If he was right when he said the hardest thing, can't we believe him when he tells lesser things that are easier to believe? Well, that's what I want to focus with you on for just a few minutes. Who did Jesus claim that he was? I've heard a lot of cult members say, you know, Jesus never claimed to be God. And in one sense, they're correct, because Jesus never said the three words, I am God. But he also never said, I am a man. Does that mean he's not a man? He never said, I am a prophet. Does that mean he's not a prophet? No. What did Jesus say about himself? Well, let's look at it. John 14, 9. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How do you say, show us the Father? So, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen God. You've seen the Father. Or in John 8, 58, Jesus said to the religious leaders of his day, He said, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. <laughs> now, he could have said, I was. And if Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I was, what would that have implied? That he was born. That he came into existence just earlier than Abraham. Now, Abraham was in existence 2,000 years prior to the time Jesus said this. So that would mean Jesus is at least 2,000 years old. But it would mean that he came into existence at some point. But he didn't say that. He said, before Abraham was born, I am. Meaning, I have an eternal self-existence. I never came into existence. I always am. I just am. Always. I'm not like the angels. God created them. I'm not like a human being. God creates them. I'm not an animal. God creates them. I am God. I am. I just am. Or John 5, 17. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this cause, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Why? Because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but he also was calling God his own Father, notice this, making himself equal with God. Equal. Not a little bit subpar, a little bit less than. The Jews understood that by, when Jesus said, He is my Father, he was making himself on an equal plane with God. Or, how about Mark chapter 2, verse 5? This is the scene where the paralytic is let down through the roof, and Jesus heals him. It says, Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, My son, your sins are forgiven. But there were some of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak this way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now let me ask you, they, they asked a good question, didn't they? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Is there anybody else that can forgive sins other than God? No. They were dead on, weren't they? 
Only God can forgive sins. So how can Jesus claim to forgive this man's sins? See, it's a backhanded way of Jesus letting them know who he was. He's God in the flesh. Or how about John chapter 10, verse 30? Jesus said, I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which one of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. See, the Jews knew exactly what Jesus was claiming when he said, I and the Father are one. And the Jews had a law for people who committed blasphemy. If someone claimed to be God, and of course wasn't, the, the, the penalty for that crime of blasphemy was capital punishment or stoning. And so on more than one occasion, the Jews tried to actually kill Jesus. They tried to execute him for blaspheming. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, it's only blasphemy if he wasn't God. If he was God, it's not blasphemy. Let's look at one more. Mark chapter 14, verse 61. Here Jesus is being interrogated by the religious leaders on the night before he goes to the cross. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, what? I am. I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and he said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. So Jesus over and over and over let them know exactly who he was. Now, He's unique. Think about Buddha. Buddha never claimed to be God. Muhammad never claimed to be God. He claimed to be a prophet of God. Jesus is unique amongst all the religious leaders the world has ever known because he claimed to be God in human flesh. Now anybody can make a claim like that. I can claim right now that I'm God. If I made that claim, what would you do? <laughs> You'd leave. Someone start laughing. Someone just, no, oh, Brian's crazy today. <laughs> you know, because you wouldn't take me seriously. What if Barack, o, Barack Obama got on television tonight and on the, all the cameras are in his face and he's saying to them, I've got a new revelation for you. I am God. I can forgive your sins. I can raise you from the dead. I am your judge. And I can sentence you to heaven or to hell. What's going to happen if, that, if he does that on TV? <laughs> They're going to whisk him away from those cameras. They'll probably put Joe Biden as the new president. And Barack Obama's going to the insane asylum, right? Because he's just lost it. But Jesus made the claim of being God, and people actually took him seriously. Because he had a lot of credentials to back up those claims. Think about the kind of life he lived. First of all, he never sinned. Now that's different, isn't it? <laughs> Only God can never sin. And then he did things like walk on water, turn water to wine, take a few little fish and little biscuits and multiply them and feed thousands and thousands of people where he even had baskets of leftovers. He could cast demons out of people. He could heal people who had been blinded their entire life. He could heal cripples. He could heal lepers. He could raise people from the dead. Now these are the actions you would expect from who? From God. So Jesus said, I am God. And then he lived a life that backed up exactly what he said. Once we come to actually believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be, it will make a profound difference in your life. There is a British missionary by the name of C.T. Studd. He made this famous statement. If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ proves that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that he's God in human flesh. Number two, it proves that Jesus did what he claimed he would do. 
You see, Jesus was very specific about why he had come into the world. On a number of occasions, he told his disciples why he was there. Let's look at some of those. John 3.17 Jesus said, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. Or, let's look at Luke 19.10 For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Or John 10.10 10, I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. So Jesus says, I have come into the world to save and to give life. To save and to give life. Now, if we needed to be saved, what condition were we in? Okay, good. We were unsaved. The word save refers to being rescued from a great danger, doesn't it? You save a child's life if he's in a burning house and you rush up and you snatch him out of the window. You, you've rescued him from this great danger. Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He's simply telling the world that the world is lost, the world is in great danger, the world is headed for eternal damnation and destruction. They need to be saved by the Son of Man. But notice he also says that he came that they might have life. Now if he came to give them life, what condition were they in before? They're dead. They'd had, if a person has no life, they're dead. So this world is in spiritual death. The Son of Man has come to grant life, newness of life, abundant life, everlasting life. But how is he going to do it? That's the question. And I want you to look at Matthew 20, verse 28. Jesus said, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. That's how he's going to do it. The Son of Man, Jesus, has come to give his life for a specific purpose. He's going to give his life as a ransom you guys have watched the old movies, haven't you, where there's a little kid who's kidnapped and uh, the kidnapper says, I want $5 million by this day, at this time, call me up in this phone booth and leave the money in a brown paper sack. <laughs> and if the money's left there, I'll release your son. If you don't give me the money, I'm going to kill him. Well, when the parent, the rich parent, leaves the $5 million in the brown paper sack in the phone booth, the child goes free, he's been ransomed. The five million dollars is the ransom price. It redeems, it releases, it sets free someone who's captive. When Jesus says that he's going to give his life as a ransom, he's saying that we're all captives. That we're all in bondage. We were prisoners to Satan, to sin, to death, and to hell, and eternal damnation. We were caught in the grip of our own sin that was heading us off to perdition. But Jesus came to give his own life as a ransom price, the purchase price to grant eternal life and eternal salvation to those who were spiritually dead and those who were spiritually lost. Now, how do we know that God accepted Jesus' death as full payment for our sin? How can we ever know that? He could claim it, and then he could die, and we'd always be wondering, well, did, was it enough? Could, was it enough for God? Was it sufficient to actually pay for our sins? Folks, that's the glory of Easter, of the resurrection, because the empty tomb proves once and for all that God the Father accepted the payment of God the Son. It was enough. Now, let, let's just imagine that it wasn't enough. It was 99% but not 100. Well, then Jesus would still be in that tomb. But God raising him up and then causing him to ascend to heaven to be at his right hand is full proof that God has accepted in full payment for our sins. Kelly quoted this verse earlier, but it's, a, it's an awesome verse. He who was delivered up because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Because the cross 
was enough to justify us and to forgive us and to cleanse us and purify us, God raised him up from the dead. So do you want proof this morning that you can be saved? That you can have every one of your sins forgiven, past, present, and future? That you can be in heaven forever with Christ in glory, enjoying Him and worshiping Him and lavishing your love on Him and receiving glory? Look at that tomb that's empty. You know, the body of Jesus Christ has never been found. Isn't that interesting? The religious leaders of Jesus' day would have loved to have carted that body through the streets of Jerusalem to silence them because they were preaching the resurrection. But they never did it because it was not able to be found. That body was raised and then it was ascended to heaven. So, number two, the resurrection proved Jesus did what he claimed he would do, obtain eternal salvation for his people. Number three, it proved Jesus will do what he claimed he will do. John 14, 19, Jesus said, Because I live, you shall live also. So what does he mean? He means because he has the essence of eternal life abiding in himself, he's going to transmit that eternal life to others. Because he lives, they're going to live. Through a joint union. It's like taking a dead branch, grafting it onto a living tree, Pretty soon you see leaves sprouting from that once dead branch. We were spiritually dead. We're joined to Christ by faith. We start producing fruit. Greenery starts coming out. Life, signs of life start happening. Because he lives, we shall live also. Because he was raised, we will be raised. Or John 5, 28 and 29. Jesus said, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life. Those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. So notice this. There is a specific time in the future that's coming. When that hour has come, every ear will hear his voice. All those who are in the tombs. So if we've died... By the time that happens, we're going to hear the voice of the Son of Man. And we're going to rise. Everyone's going to rise. Whether you're saved or lost, we're all going to rise from the dead. And then we will give an account to the one who made us. And those who through faith in Christ produced a life of fruit, good fruit, good deeds, they will receive a resurrection of life. But to those who did not come to Christ in living faith and lived a life of sin, he says, they will be raised to a resurrection of judgment. Or Matthew 25, 31. Here the text says that when the Son of Man comes in His glory, all the angels are going to come with Him and He's going to sit on a glorious throne. He's going to be a king. He's going to be a judge. And all the nations are going to be gathered before Him. And He's going to separate the nations as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. He's going to put the sheep over on His right-hand side. He's going to put the goats on His left-hand side. And He's going to turn to the sheep... And he's going to say to them, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Jesus makes a claim here that he's going to say to certain people, not depart, but come. Not you cursed, but you blessed of my Father inherit the kingdom that I have prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This is the claim that Jesus is making of what he will do for all who trust him. Or how about John eleven twenty five 25 and 26? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So what does Jesus claim he will do? He claims that he's going to raise people to a resurrection of life. He claims that he's going to call them to himself to inherit an eternal kingdom with himself. He claims that they're never going to die. But did you see that it's very specific as to who receives those blessings? 
John eleven twenty five. 25, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who what? Believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Believers in Christ will never die. The resurrection proves that Jesus is God in human flesh. The resurrection proves that he paid for our sin and our salvation. And the resurrection proves that he will grant everlasting life and an eternal inheritance to, to those who believe in him. But there's the rub. Are you a believer? Do you trust in Jesus? So what does it mean to trust Jesus? What does that really mean? Let's imagine that we're in a a jumbo jet, we're traveling to New York City, and all of a sudden you, we hear these explosions go off, and the plane starts taking a nosedive, and it's descending very rapidly, and the stewardesses run out of the cabin, and they say, quick, quick, put these parachutes on. Both engines have exploded. We're going down. Your only hope to be saved is to jump from the plane and pull the ripcord. And you could take a look at that parachute, and you could say, wow, that's really a pretty parachute. I like the colors on that thing. And boy, it really looks sturdy. You know, I bet if I actually put that thing on and pulled the ripcord, I bet it would work. Are you trusting the parachute? No. You're admiring it, but you're not trusting it. You don't trust the parachute until you strap it on and you jump out of that plane and you pull the cord. And folks, you can't be saved as long as you just admire Jesus. You got to strap him on and you got to pull the cord. In other words, you got to fully commit to Christ. You see, once you jump from that plane, you've just left every other hope you ever had of, of being saved, haven't you? And you put all your hope in the parachute. That's what it means to be saved. You let go of Buddha, you let go of Joseph Smith, you let go of Muhammad, you let go of your good works, you let go of your supposed good heart and your generous nature, you let go of everything else and you say, Jesus, you're my only hope. And if you don't save me, I'm damned forever. You see? You trust Him. You fully commit your eternal salvation to Him and to Him alone. I've talked to a lot of people and I always ask them this question. Let's say you died and you stand before God. God asks you, well, why should I allow you into my heaven? How, how would you respond to Him? And 99 times out of 100, people will say something like, because I followed by something because I've a good person because I've got a good heart because I've not done anything really bad because I've tried to do unto others as I want them to do unto me and it's do you see what they're doing they're pointing the finger back at themselves as the hope of eternal life they're actually trusting in themselves that they're good enough that they've done something that God would accept folks it's the wrong answer <laughs> That's, that's, like, that's like staying on the airplane rather than jumping and trusting the parachute. You're going down if you're trusting in yourself. You've got to stop trusting in yourself and you've got to start trusting solely and completely in Jesus Christ. Put all of your eggs in His basket. He Bank your eternal soul on what He has done. You've got to say, Lord, when you died on that cross, it was enough. When you rose from the dead, that was good enough. And my hope is in that. And so when the Lord asks you, well, why should I allow you into heaven? You say, well, Lord, you really shouldn't. Because I'm a sinner. I'm foul. I'm unclean. I'm guilty. I'm a wretch in your sight, Lord. I know that. Through and through, I've sinned every day of my life. I've got no hope in me, Lord. But I am putting all my trust in this other guy over here, this Jesus, this sinless one, this perfect one, the one who died for my sins and rose for my justification. All my hope and all my trust is in him. Folks, that is how a person comes to saving faith. It's leaving any hope in themselves behind and it's putting all their trust and hope in Jesus Christ. And is there anyone here this morning that has never come to a point where they've done that? If you've never come to faith in Jesus Christ, trust Him today. Trust Him right now. You see, to leave every other hope, that's called repentance. You turn loose. You turn loose of every other hope. 
I've told this illustration a million times, but it, I'll tell it again because it's a good one. If you've been uh, prospecting for gold and you've got two big bags of gold and you're on a ship and the wind blows you over and there you go, you're going to sink if you hold on to that, that gold. But at the same time, someone on the boat throws you a life rope. You've got to do two things. Let go of the rope. If you don't, you're, you're going down. You've got to let, turn loose of that rope, or of the gold, and then you've got to cling to the rope. Turning loose of the gold is repentance. You've got to be willing to turn loose of sin. Let it go. Turn loose. Open up your hands and just let it drop. And then you've got to cling to Jesus as your only hope. And I'm asking the Lord this morning to seal this truth in the heart of some people here today that maybe have never been saved. If you have been saved, would you just rejoice in your Savior today? That you're free. You're free from sin. You're headed for glory for all eternity. That weight of sin is gone, never to return again. No matter what the future holds, if you're in Him, you're in Him. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You have life. <laughs> the life that is in Him is in you because of union to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, would you do your mighty work today by the power of the Holy Spirit. Take the truth of the gospel, Lord, and make it live in the hearts of your people. If there are those here today that don't know you, Lord, you know that none of us can make it happen, but you certainly can. If you could raise Jesus from the dead, Father, then you can certainly raise people from spiritual death to spiritual life right now. So Lord, cause that to happen and send us forth from this place rejoicing that we can know our Savior because He's alive. We can interact with Him. We can, he can show up in our lives. We can talk with Him and He can talk with us. Lord, we glory in Your Son, Jesus. We love Him. And we praise You for Him. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.